Okay, so excited to see you all this morning. Thank you for coming out this Friday. It's a blessing to be together. I'm going to uh, start by uh, opening us up in prayer. Father God, thank you for all the gifts that you give us and all the opportunities to glorify you through those gifts, Father God. Every student here, Lord, um, every gift that they have, Lord, that we are here to help them realize and help them grow and just um, not only internalize, but externalize, get it out there in the world, Lord, as we're here to um, help each child blossom, Father God, in your name, for your glory. That's why we're here, Lord, to serve you and to let them know the joy of what it feels like when they are in their gifting each student to glorify you. And as the parents come alongside, Lord, for them to have peace, the world is constantly throwing things at them and trying to scare them. Satan's like a barking dog. We have to remember, Father God, he's on a leash. You've got the other end. You've already won. Um, and that um, all things, it's your kingdom come, Lord. It's your kingdom, nobody else's. Your kingdom come, and it's your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So I always like to start out, in case there's any new people, just with a brief, uh, what is this parent panel? Okay, it's not policies, procedures. It's not, um, it's just basically... Our different takes on, on, we've been road tested, some of us up here, all of us up here have been road tested, and everyone here on this panel is either here because of they work with a, a certain age or stage or work with all the ages and stages, right? So we've, we've kind of been road tested, and the reason this panel came about is I remember as a mom when I would try to get advice, you know, and I wanted Christian advice, and maybe I'd, you know, hear it from one person, and I'd be like, that is awesome advice, but it does not feel like it fits my family. So here we have all different, that's why we call it panel, perspective panel, right? We have all different perspectives, right? And so each person's going to say how they approach something. Um, and when we do it, we're going to also say, if you could say, you know, this is what we did with lower school. This is what we did with middle. This is what we did with upper. You know, when our kid was going through this stage, everybody's not an expert in everything, okay? And again, we are not here to set policy. We're just here to give a perspective. Once in a while, we might say, oh, the school policy is X if it comes up, right? And so it was really interesting. I love doing the QR code. Uh, Holly Hamilton, who works with Dan, collected all the data. And I just love it because um, to see the questions that come in. We cannot obviously hit on every question, but I have them all printed out. And we're going to talk about generally those questions in each category. So our categories, as you know, are stress and anxiety and fear of failure, OK? And so um, what I did was I stress I broke down with social. And then there's performance, right? Those are the kind of the two big areas that come up with stress uh, and anxiety. And then that's for the student, okay? Then the parent, we broke it down to, we're going to get into kind of like wellness tips because the, the less stress that you have as a parent, those kids are barometers, right? And they pick up on that. So we're going to get into some wellness tips there with that. Um, and then failure, you know, Coping with failure, perceived or real, my, my word now for failure is learning. <laughs> I don't call it failure anymore. <laughs> I call it learning because that's really what it is, right? So anyway, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to start with the first, which is social. And what I'd like to do is just briefly highlight some of the input we got on some of the social concerns. So I'm just going to shotgun it out there. Some of this is going to resonate with you. Um, which grade is optimal for friendships to develop, sustain, and thrive? What can we do at home to encourage healthy relationships? This is social. Um, what are coping mechanisms for that, that worry and perfectionism, like with friendships? Okay, that's also performance, but social as well. Um, what about I'm with new kids? My child here is new, and we've been here, or we've been here three years, and we still can't break through. I love that particular one, social, because we went through that, by the way. Um, and then um, I'm trying to think other social here that I want to highlight. Those are the main with social. Being new, the friendship thing, how do I navigate friendships, and how do I um, just feel like I fit in, basically, is the main thing with social. And then there's this oddball one, but it comes up every time. 
two specific ones, one on homecoming and one on advisory. I want to talk about the homecoming one just to get that out of the way. I know this doesn't apply to everybody here, but it always comes up with homecoming, and it's the same question. It kind of cracks me up. I have heard at after parties that if you don't have a date, you will not be invited to the after party. Okay, I can tell you as a parent that has hosted after parties, I did not hire Dan Panetti as a bouncer at the front door <laughs> to say, oh, they don't have a date, out of here. No, I'm just saying. Now, obviously, you know, kids are gonna, like-minded, they're gonna invite their friends, but always remember, and I'm not trying to burden you, you can have an after party too. After parties are run by parents. And so the way we managed it is there were, there were years my boys didn't take a date and they hung out with their friends and, you know, the man party, whatever, you know, um, and just had a great time. But the other thing I want to say about homecoming, because it drives me nuts, the stress involved with homecoming, for the girl, no one put it out this time, but it's been put out in the past, what if I don't get asked, okay? Can I tell you the best parties I've ever had is when I didn't get asked? Because, you know, just remind them, guess what? Here's the, here's the spoiler alert. They're going to sit with their friends anyway. <laughs> when they go to homecoming, they're going to sit with their friends anyway. So just reiterate to have a good time and not to worry about that. But that always comes up. I just had to bring that up. Even though we just passed it, there are people that they put it here as a question. Advisory groups is the other thing that comes up. They are assigned by the upper school principal. If there are concerns with that, you can talk to the upper school principal about that, okay? So don't fret about that now. But those questions came up, so I just wanted to kind of address those just off the bat. So I'm going to start with the new kid idea. And the new kid, as in maybe you've been here three years and your kid still feels like a hard time breaking through. Prestonwood has had, obviously, the blessing. This is a blessing of many families returning and people know, knowing each other for years, right? And even as adults sometimes, we're not always, I mean, we're better as adults to realize if a new person walks in the room, hey, let's engage that person. Children don't have those social skills yet, right? And it's really hard. Because I remember when mine was new, I would say to him, hey, let's go and say hello to these people. You know, keep trying. And he tried, and it was hard. So before I let these experts start giving their opinion, I'm just going to say the way we dealt with it was there's a few people in the room that always hang out together, and everybody kind of focuses on the cool people. There's a whole room of other people. There's always someone to be friends with. So look around, open your eyes. And you know, in our case, we had a kid that his mom was later to pick him up for soccer. I offered to give a ride. We, over the years, developed a friendship, wound up being one of his best friends. So um, the new kid thing is real, and it's hard. Extracurriculars help. So just keep at it. But let me tell you the beauty of the new kid thing that I learned this year. And this is where the wisdom's going to come in. I was, a parent was struggling because her son had been at Prestonwood their whole life. And this isn't scary yet. It's normal for anyone that hasn't had a lot of change. And then the child went to college. It was the child's first time being new at college. That was hard. So this is what I want to tell you about being the new kid. Everybody is going to be the new kid at one point in their life. The earlier you learn how to be the new kid, the better. So don't be afraid of it. They're learning vital skills in that. So socially, I'm just going to go ahead and talk, uh, ask our panel members what their uh, advice would be on making friendships and just kind of what that looks like, lower school, middle school, upper school, and worrying about not having friends, because I'm sure they've all been through it. And this is, um, I'm going to have each one of them introduce themselves and tell you uh, what their role is. And Michael, go ahead. My name is Michael Perrin. This is my wife, Christina. We oversee an aspect of the ministry at Prestonwood called Life Recovery, uh, helping people recover the life that Christ intended. It involves addiction and things of that nature, but it also involves anxiety and depression, stress, grief, anything under that umbrella, that's where we kind of come in. Uh, I've been on staff, back on staff now for five years, uh, been sober uh, myself for 25 years, and we have uh, three children. We have a son who is now in Norfolk, Virginia, married, officer in the Navy. Yeah, there you go, surface warfare. Uh, and then we have a daughter named Bella. She's 20. She is a lifer from Prestonwood. She is at Oklahoma Baptist University. And then we have a gift, our gift, Michaela. She is in third grade. Um, it was not a mistake. It was a gift from her mother to us from birth. So uh, that is what we have. Let's go ahead and finish introductions. 
All right, my name is Shannon Cole, and I have the privilege of serving as Plano Head of School and then also supervise, so assistant superintendent over curriculum for the entire system. Um, I am married, have two boys. They are older, so they have made it through all of these phases. They did not come. We didn't have the benefit of them coming through the PCA system, uh, which I will tell you is a regret. I've only been here two years, but as I watch the system function, as I see kids and their success um, and the things that they learn here, um, it makes me look back. I know you're not supposed to look back, but it makes me look back and go, oh, what would they be like if they had experienced that? And we made an intentional decision that our children would go to public school. That was, I was a public school teacher. That was my mission field. And so that was important. They got great educations, but there are distinctives at PCA. In fact, I was visiting a class in the Bible department um, a few weeks ago, um, Steve Lee. And it's hard not to sit in a class like that and go, and what would my children have benefited by being in that system? And so your kids are in an amazing place. It is a blessing. Um, we're not perfect, and children are not perfect. And so I think as we answer these questions, that will come out, and it's okay. Mr. Panetti? Yes. You're up. You get the mic. Thank you. Uh, Dan Panetti, uh, uh, new this year as Director of Parent Engagement and Ministry, um, before I was Worldview Director. Former Assistant Principal. Uh, and yes, did a real short stint as uh, Assistant Principal. Um, set, a, set a really low bar, so yeah. <laughs> still, still get uh, teased about that more than anything with, uh, with my kids. Uh, like, you were Assistant Principal? I was like, yes, and I was terrible at it. Anyway. Um, but uh, it was uh, it was awesome. Thank you. Um, but yeah, uh, Trisha and I. Trisha is a sixth grade science teacher. She still is the best teacher we have. We have great teachers, right? She's still the best teacher that we have. But we were public school people all the way as well. Um, God drug us here, kicking and screaming, um, because we didn't want any part of a private Christian school. Um, we were public school people, and God just had a different plan. And I'm I'm so grateful. So grateful that God um, had a different plan. He brought us here. Um, I've been on staff. This will be my 20th year coming up. Uh, and all of our kids. Uh, we have four kids, uh, Preston Parker, Sophie, and Campbell. Um, Preston and Parker, you know, have graduated from here, are out working now, um, you know, being a, they're doing the adulting thing and they're doing life well. Um, Sophie's at University of Arkansas as a sophomore and Campbell's a, a junior here, just re-enrolled him, right? So my last re-enrollment for his senior year. Uh, so they're all, all four of them have been lifers. Um, and it's just, it's been a, um, an incredible journey for our family uh, to be a part of PCA. Um, you know, the, the ups and the downs, the goods and the bads, um, but doing life together. I think one of the things that, that I didn't recognize coming into PCA was not how much it would affect my kids, but how much it would affect Trisha and myself and just the relationships that we have. In fact, I ran into, it's so funny, I ran into a parent the other day that we did life together with all the way through PCA and their kids are, you know, graduated and gone and our kids have graduated. And she looked at me and she's like, is there any way we can put together just a parent barbecue because I miss seeing all the parents that we did life together for 20 years. And I said, we are doing that, right? So can I just tell you, yes, your kids are here and they're getting great stuff. But I'm gonna tell you, as a parent, you're getting great stuff too. Because if you were at a public school, right? You're just not getting that stuff. You're not building those relationships. And there's something unique about that being here as a parent. So I'm really thrilled uh, when uh, Dr. Goddard said, hey, I wanna put you as Director of Parent Engagement and Ministry. And I was like, what does that mean? And he's like, well, figure it out. Um, but it's, it's thrilling. It, it is, it's so much fun to try to walk together with our parents to help us parent better uh, and to do more as parents and, to, and just enjoy, enjoy this time because it really, really is such a beautiful and special calling to be a parent. So um, I'm thrilled to be part of a school that really engages in the parent ministry aspect of it. So, Michael, back to you. Thank you. Um, I would say I'm, I'm director of spiritual development at Plano, and having grown up in a non-Christian environment every day, I thank God for this school, and I thank God that my children, uh, one now at A&M, who is a sophomore, uh, and he's engineering. He just told me he's going to do a minor in pre-med, and he said, Mom, I realize that God gave me these gifts, and what I want to use them for his glory. And he was not, he was the kid that struggled here for a long time with friendships. I see somebody not there in the back. Yeah, you know. Uh, he struggled. And um, so anyway, and he was a new kid and he felt bullied at one point, and he was. 
Um, we went through all of those stages. He begged me to homeschool him. So I'm, I'm leading us into the social part. Begged me to homeschool him. I'm like, I'm not smart enough to homeschool you. But anyway, the point is, and, and it would have been so easy to take the pain away. When they're, go, when, they're getting, when they're going through a rough time, you just want to take the pain away. And my husband was like, we need to get through this because if we teach him how to get through this, he's going to, and you know what? He's, my, he's a social butterfly now. And he you know, had no problem adapting at college and has no problem setting boundaries, but it was so hard when we were going through it. So I would just say, obviously, you know your child. And you, I would say, number one, you, you keep a close, you know, do we need counseling? You know, at what point do we possibly need counseling? Checking in every day, doing extracurriculars. The one thing my husband and I found to do was get, find his area where he would excel at and just do whatever we had to do to drive him to that thing or get him involved in that thing to build confidence. So what were some of the things that you saw at different ages and stages, um, lower, middle, and upper, where maybe struggling with being a new kid or just having a hard time making friends? Yes. For us, that is not our paradigm. Uh, our children entered in, and they were influencers. They were the outgoing, gregarious Everybody is their friend. They're the life of the party. We're going to have friends. So our angle is from the other side of the equation. So it's not necessarily a new child. It is our children and what is their responsibility as a Christian. And so we always encourage our kids to go find the new person, to go talk to the new person, to go engage the new person. And that started at home. Uh, when I pick up, even when I pick up Michaela, our, our third grader, our little one, one of the questions I ask her is, you know, who did you help today? What did you do today? Uh, our daughter, Bella, Christina tells an amazing story of, you know, who she is as a person. Uh, somebody did something to another kid and the teacher wanted to know who it was. And so Bella grabbed the person by the scruff of the neck and literally carried him, him over to the teacher and said, here he is. And, and that's, but her purpose in doing that was to, again, help others and protect. And that's what we instill in our kids. So go find, we encourage our kids. And if there's some lifers that I just talked to, who are they engaging? Who are they talking to? Do they look for the person on the outside and invite them in? Because as believers, as Christians, that is our role. That is our responsibility. So that's kind of our side of the equation. We all good? <laughs> um, okay, so a couple things from a parenting perspective. Um, four kids, um, all four are different. Um, two really, really struggled to um, find friends, make friends. Um, two do not struggle with that. So it's, it's been kind of a, a unique um, journey, right, from a parenting perspective to try to figure out how to parent them. Um, a couple things uh, just in terms of like conversations with our kids and other parents, um, the stress of trying to impress their peers. I think that to me is the biggest thing from that younger age, um, looking around at who you're trying to impress and why is this stressing you out. Um, in our family, uh, words are super important to me. Um, we're not allowed to use the word friends unless the person really is a friend. And you may be thinking, well, what are they then? And here's the deal. And if I brought my kids up here, they'd, right, they parrot what I do because they mock it. But later, they'll understand. Um, here's the deal. When you go to class with somebody, you're called a classmate. When you play sports together with somebody, you're called a teammate. Okay? A friend is, and this is a George Washington thing, right? Um, friendship is a plant of slow growth that must withstand the shocks of adversity before it's given the name. So here's the deal. A friend is a person who has your back no matter what. And even if it's willing to cost them something, they have your best interest in mind. Now here's the deal. When you put that definition of friend together, right, that isn't the person who's sitting there over in class that you're like, man, they're so popular, I hope they, like, they pay attention to me. Okay, great, that's a classmate and you wanna impress them, but just don't call them a friend, right? So when that person doesn't invite you to homecoming, right, it's not like a friend didn't do something. It's a popular person that you wanna impress for some reason because of your own insecurities, right, that you need to get over yourself. Okay, so yeah, there's a lot of um, grace in our family um, as we talk to our kids. <laughs> but but that's, that's the reality, right? Um, fear of missing out, we've told our kids this a hundred times, right? Yes, you will miss out on things, right? You do not have to have a fear of that, you will, right? So you can get rid of FOMO, you will miss out on things. 
Um, and, and we still do to this day, right? My wife will get on social media every once in a while. We're 50 years old, and we see things that we're like, why was everybody else invited and we weren't? So just understand, it, it happens, okay? And we have the conversations with our kids. And, and the reality is, is if you want to do something differently, um, you know, then you need to do it differently. So Maria, same thing, right? You want to have a homecoming party and your kid didn't get invited. Fantastic. Have one at your house. You know, well, not all the popular kids are going to show up. Well, who cares? Right? Just, you know, it's, it's so much of that. We're looking at what everybody else has, right? And we're missing the opportunity to do things on our, on our own. So, yes, my daughter um, got asked in ninth grade, right, to homecoming. She never got asked again after that because ninth grade is kind of that big year. Um, you know, we're looking at doing something different about that from a school perspective, all that. But here's the deal, right? We had three boys. We made our boys ask somebody, okay? It, it wasn't like you were taking somebody, you know, to get married. But, yes, we made our boys ask somebody. It's a great training opportunity for them to do it. Right? you got to go ask the dad, can I take your daughter to homecoming? The dad has an opportunity to talk to the boy about how precious his daughter. So it, anyway, all that is just part of the training opportunity. Okay? So we, we did it. We survived it. Um, you will too. Um, it's not, it, here's the deal. It's not that big of a deal. Right? Don't overstress it. Don't overthink it. Um, when your daughter doesn't get asked, right? send her with 20 of her friends, and she'll have a much better time than the daughter who did get asked, and now she's with a group of people that she doesn't like. So tell, tell your daughter that, right? Yeah, that girl who got asked, trust me, she's having a terrible time. You're having a great time, so get over it, right? For, for, the, for the boys, right? I mean, and, and it happened to Campbell this year. It's so funny, right? Campbell, um, you know, has a, has a girlfriend, and he ended up with a group of people um, that kind of weren't his people because he went with her people, and so um, he would rather be with his people. And just it's everybody's going through it, right? So I just I think it's that whole concept, friends, um, just own the word, right, uh, for young people in developing. I think, you, you know, you guys are great. Um, if you're here, look for new people. Look for people who are sitting alone. Uh, look for people who don't have a friends. You can always be a friend even if you don't have friends. I think that's the biggest thing for me, right? Well, I don't have friends. Fantastic. Go be one. Go be one. Go be one. And then once you are a friend, right, people will look around and go like, oh, that's a person I want to then be with, right? But if you're not willing to put yourself out there and be that person, right, then you're not gonna have those connections as well. And honestly, um, at my age right now, if you ask me who are my friends, right, it's five people, right? If you go look at my Facebook page, okay, which I don't get on, but anyway, right, there's thousands of connections I have. There's classmates, there's teammates, there's acquaintances, there's connections, there's things like that. But friends, right, it's a handful of people. I'm grateful to be your colleague. <laughs> Shannon's one of my friends. <laughs> and that's two, three, so that leaves you with two people. There you go. <laughs> Here's all my friends. <laughs> and they're good friends, I'm telling you. Okay, Maria, I'm sorry to disappoint. We raised boys. Um, if you have boys and girls, they're very different animals. I had nieces, so I observed these types of things, anomalies, with not making friends and I, I, I can't find a friend or nobody will be my friend. I didn't experience those things. Uh, my children were raised with the same church friends and the same school friends from the day they walked into kindergarten until they graduated. And so I think that changes the challenges there. For me as an educator, um, it is always about, because I have a teacher lens and I have a leadership lens, and so when I think about the teachers and church leaders and adults who lead groups, I always think about how are you leading that group so that it is inclusive. There are ways to structure, um, maybe it's a classroom. Um, we had specific ways where it is more inclusive. We don't allow those clicks. You create opportunities for kids to collaborate and learn about each other so that they understand that there are ways they're the same and there are ways that they're different and we celebrate all of that. And so for me, even as a school leader now, when I work with principals or visit a classroom with a teacher, those are the things that I'm looking for. For me, that classroom environment is critical because it can support how a student connects 
when they're feeling lost. I always appreciated when a parent would come to me, and maybe it, w it usually was a young lady, I'm not gonna lie. Um, you know, my daughter's in your fourth grade class or your fifth grade class. She's new and she is struggling with making friends. And so as a teacher, it was good for me to have that information so that I could seek those opportunities to connect her with kids that she was like. And so that's, I don't know if that's helpful. No, that's a really good point, the girl guy thing. And just, just you know, brain summing up, you know, getting, putting this together. When I look at the two types of situation, the kids that, hey, they don't have a problem making friends, the kids that struggle, I had one of each. And uh, the one that, you know, is a gregarious, he's the homecoming king, literally, okay? He just, and that was very opposite personality of my other one. They're very different. Now, with him, when I look at, well, what, what is the difference if I was going to really drill down? Honestly, at an earlier age, he had more confidence in Christ. So all this boils down to this friend thing or not friend thing is truly that reminder that your friend is Jesus. And I would always say we ask God to bring us good people in our life, and we ask God for the people that are not ones that were to pray for them. And when my son was being bullied, that was one of the things I said, and it was the hardest thing for me to say, we're going to pray for the bully. Okay, and I didn't say the bully, but you get the idea. Let's pray for them. I found out two years later from the mom, they were, had gone through a nasty divorce. Two years after that, they're on the soccer field. Who passed you the ball? It was the bully. Okay, I love telling that story. Guys, I mean, they didn't even, you know, they blink of an eye. They, it, but it was painful, and it was real. When he, he didn't want to get up and go to school. Okay, so I'm not trying to minimize it because I know people in this room are here because they're going through something like that, okay? The girl thing can be very mean. I went through a mean girl thing. It changed my life, truly. I'm a biblical counselor probably because of it. And the mean girl thing, but the funny thing with the mean girl thing, and this is the blessing of being old, right? Perspective is it, before I was old, literally in my 30s, the, there was three girls that had ganged up on me. And this was shocking. They contacted me in my 30s. And they apologized. And I was like, oh, you know, life's good. Everything, you know, it's okay. The Lord I forgave. I for, you know, no. What had happened was they had daughters. And so that's the thing. And, and I say that even to kids now. You may not realize it, but someday you're going to look back and say, wow, somebody I love could be being treated the way I'm treating somebody. They, don't, they can't conceptualize necessarily being a parent. But the idea of somebody I love what if they were treated, or what if I was treated this way? You know, just, because you know what? It catches up. And I don't mean that in a negative thing or that the Lord doesn't forgive. I'm just saying every point of these things eventually come out. So it is real, um, but this too shall pass. This too shall pass. And just dig in and get the necessary help you need to encourage Grandpa helped us a lot. Grandpa would talk to the son that was going through a rough time because he gave the perspective, you know, that unconditional love, but also that, you know what, oh, I remember this, and I remember, just constantly reminding, and I will tell you this number one thing, the calmer you are, the more confident you are in the outcome, the more you reiterate how Jesus, God is in control, and mom had friends, and I always say, you haven't even met your best friend yet. And think about that. And I'm talking about human best friend, because the reality is hopefully that's your spouse, right? Now, some of them might have met their spouse in third grade, but most of them haven't. So anyway, just to give that kind of a, they need from us what they can't really get or conceptualize is that there, there's a before, there's a during, and there's an after. And it's not going to be like this forever, okay? Now, with parents' um, stress and anxiety, and just I want to touch on performance real quick, because this is real. One of the people said, and I thought, you know, it was very interesting. I said, um, and this comes up from time to time, and I am, this is above my pay grade, what I'm about to bring up, okay? It's not my area. But it says, you know, what about cognitive and social-emotional perspectives when we come to testing or grade-focused methods? Now, before everybody panics, because they know that that's not my area, I, I do have one thing to add. We've been, we got an expert, we truly have an expert on here, but I want to give a parent perspective of having been through Montessori, constructivism, highly gifted program, public, private. We've worked through all of them. No, it wasn't because we just had a bunch of problems. We lived in California, you know, different ages and stages. Um, I, I've literally been through different, school, probably four or five different school models, and I thank God for it. And can I just tell you, even though it might take one stressor away, there's going to be another stressor. So I don't, I, you know, I'm not saying there not, might not be a perfect model for your child, 
and that's something that you can look into. But the thought that if it were such and such that there would be no stress is, you know, it's not real. So I just want to say that, and I don't mean to dummy this down or insult anyone's intelligence, just wanted to give that perspective having been to different types. So we'll have our panelists talk about just, you know, basically how their kid dealt with stress and the bigger question on it was, how do they deal with the stress of homework? What is it like in high school? What is it like with extracurricular? How did you help your child balance performance and workload? Okay, and also, how did you help them balance, let's say they were excelling in something, and now they feel like they've got to keep producing at that level. What I would always say to my kid is, I love you. God gave you gifts. You're going to feel better if you do your best to use those gifts. But I love you no matter what. So, you know, just reinforcing that. So we'll start with, how did you balance the extracurricular and the homework with your kids? How did you help them do that? Okay, so... Isabella, our middle child, was a, a force. I mean, she picked up that kid by the, and she took him to the teacher, and that, that was the beginning. I knew what kind of child she was. And so she became a soccer goalie at the young age of six. And I mean full-blown academy soccer goalie. And coaches started coming, and uh, Olympic, U.S. Olympic training her at the age of 10. And it was so stressful. And she was a good B, C student. She was not top of the class. We did not, we just said, give your very best. And that was that. But she started feeling the, the stress of getting Cs. And even to the point of some of the teachers were like, you know, maybe she has a learning disability. Well, why don't you have? And we looked at each other and we thought, well, that, I, I don't think that's really, when is a B or when is a C student not okay? I personally was a C student until I got to college. And so we didn't really buy into that, but we had her tested and they said, no, sure, her cognitive skills, everything's great. She's not dyslexic. She's not this, she's not that. And so, but I think that put some doubt in her, but we remained steady on this is how God has made you. These are your gifts and talents over here. We're going to balance them. That word balance is so important in the house. We're going to balance. We're not going to stress you out. There was a point after the Olympic training that she said, I'm done. I'm done with soccer. I can't do it. I can't do. And we were, of course, your parent, as parents, you're like, go, go, go. And we let her quit when she finished the season. And we prayed. And do you know that by the time she got to middle school here, she said, okay, I'll start again. And it was eighth grade. She picked it back up. She ended up being all state here at PCA. She plays now on the men's and women's team at OBU. But we let her decide it was too much. We didn't push. As, as, and all the coaches were coming at us like, are you kidding? Are you crazy? She's built for this. She's made for this mentally. We've never seen anything like this. Guys, she's out. And so we let her choose, and of course we prayed about it. And then when she came back and was able to do it on her own here, it was beautiful and wonderful. And she says, I don't want to be a professional player. She didn't want to do that. And she ended up getting a scholarship at OBU, and she turned it down. She went, she ended up, now this little BEC student ended up with a 75% academic scholarship at Oklahoma Baptist University. So there's the BC student, and she took it, and she's straight A's, has been on the presidential list for three semesters now. But as a parent, we did not push. We did not kick her into what we thought she should be, even though the whole world was like, are you sure? Because that's what she that's what she should be. That is an incredible testimony. I don't know about you all. That is amazing. That's amazing. All right, this is my advice. First of all, know your children. Um, uh, you, I think, as a parent, have to quickly uncover how your child um, responds to stress or what are the self-induced um, achievement goals that they put on themselves because some kids are naturally driven where others may not have as much drive. Some kids will internalize that stress and others let it roll off like a duck. And so I think you have to know your kids. We had two very different boys. We had one son that 
man, we look like great parents. He was brilliant, and that boy, he was born with a ball in his hand, and he could do every sport, um, and he could do all of those things so seamlessly and, and just make it all happen. His grades were amazing. Um, I still remember in high school uh, sitting in a conference because we would walk their schedule. He always had all A's always achieved at really high levels. He was in a class of about 600. He was number five without ever opening a book. But he hit the wall in college. Our other student struggled from the get-go, struggled with reading, struggled socially, but had a strong desire to socialize and have those friends, and he did figure it out. Um, was tested, he received services through special education, so work and school was hard for him, but he developed a work ethic. We never reduced what was expected of him. We entertained a lot of conversations from him as to why God made him that way. He watched his brother breeze through tests um, and score really high, and he didn't understand why he was not that person. And so I think as a parent, you're pouring into your child what is the inner monologue? What's the parent words that they're going that you're going to imprint in their brain? And it always was God made you perfect the way he wanted you. And there's a reason and he'll reveal it at some point why you are struggling with this. And so know your kids. And I would also say, at some point, you have to prepare them um, when it comes back to the achievement piece. You, your grades, do not define you. Do not allow that to happen. That is an, it's an uneven measuring stick. And when you have a kid that gave 110% and they get a 70, that is worth celebrating just as much as my older child who gave 50% and still blew it out of the water with 100%. What are you affirming in your child as they are working through that? And I, I'm just going to be honest. I think I've said this to parents one time before. As a teacher, and it was, it was as a teacher. I didn't get this when we were raising our kids. I changed my wording with students. I used to tell kids, man, Dan, you are so smart. You are so intelligent. I worked in a Spanish school. Muy inteligente, Daniel. And then I went to a training with some very wise, um, secular teachers and leaders. However, this was great wisdom. If I'm intelligent, that's wonderful. Because we can do, we can have them tested and I can show what their ability is. But what effort are they putting into the work? And so I, I stopped as a principal affirming kids for their intelligence and their smarts. I started watching specifically for what are they doing? What's your work ethic? I saw how hard you worked on that piece of writing. I saw you reading it out loud. I saw you using the strategies that I taught you and look how far you came. You have to focus on the effort and not the outcome. And that's, okay, I'm, I'm gonna stop preaching now. Dan? No, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I, okay, that's coming from our head of school. Um, I would say take that, um, share it with everybody you know, because, I mean, honestly, um, from a biblical perspective, right, God's given your children, you know, gifts and abilities and talents, right? Um, what they do with them is what your job is from a parenting perspective, Amen. right? So effort, that's what, that's what you want to look at, is how well are you doing, right? That's how I was raised. That's how we raised our kids. Um, please don't fall into the parent trap of looking at your kids' grades um, because a grade, right, is something that somebody's giving them based on their evaluation of where they are at that particular moment. But you're right. We don't know if, okay, you know, that kid's brilliant and they worked, you know, hardly at all and they got an A versus the kid who's working their tail off and they've learned a thousand times more and they got a B or a C. That, can I tell you, one of the things I love about PCA, though, is you can, you can find a level for them to fit into. So I know there's other schools that, you know, it's like, you know, we're, we're only high performing. It's just like, oh, my goodness, it's high school. Get over yourself, right? No, here's it. You don't know my GPA, and I don't know your GPA, right? I mean, it's, a, it, it's 
Sophie was my student who struggled the most here at PCA. Struggled, struggled, struggled. Worked, 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 worked. She goes to Arkansas and she gets two four point outs. Okay, because here's the deal. The one thing I know about Sophie is she knows how to work hard. Okay? She'll outwork anybody else. So if you've got kids who are tons smarter and don't know how to work hard, you know what? We all know that it'll eventually catch up to them. If you can just get your kids to work hard and you can push past the whole, look at everybody else. Don't worry about everybody else. You just keep on working hard. Okay, that to me, from an academic standpoint, is the most important thing that they can learn while they're here, right? Your job is to learn how to work hard, learn as much as you can, and I will say this, for those kids who don't get the grade, the first question we always came back with, did you do the work, yeah. right? Did you, and I'll just tell you, right, there's tons of kids, so don't be the parent who's just like, well, my kid got to see it, it's that teacher's fault. Your kid didn't read the book, right? Your kid hadn't been to class yet, I mean, come on. So you have to do the job from the parenting perspective to say, are you doing the work? Are you putting in the effort? And if the answer is no, it's not the teacher's fault. Okay, that teacher can't teach. Well, the book is there. Did you read it? Okay, and I'm just gonna tell you, a lot of our kids look for shortcuts on everything and it's not gonna benefit them when they get out in life. So have them do the work. Don't worry about the grade. As long as they know how to work hard, they will be fine. You know, it's funny because it, did you have something to add? The, um, the flip side of this, on the other end of the continuum, my mother had a doctorate, and she died of dementia. We all know the sports athlete that had everything invested, and they blow out a knee. Identity needs to be in Christ, because everything else is going to be stripped away. And even as their children, when we start with them as children, and you know what? The more they have their identity in Christ, it really is true. It's not just a tagline. They will worry less about fitting in with friendships and all that because they'll put their identity in Christ and then they'll start seeking out friends that also do that. And those, most of the time, nobody's perfect, but those are typically the people that are not going to be causing mayhem for no reason at all. How about that? I mean, there's enough mayhem. But the point is that the more you can, you know, it starts literally, and, and I know a lot of you do it, you know, praying with them in the morning, you know, them seeing you pray in the morning, pray at night, them seeing you put God first and how you handle a problem with a peer. We all have, you know, we, or, you know, how do I handle it with the person that's working on my house and not doing the job right or whatever it is, right? And also, I want to say, I love how the Bible gives us the parable of the talents, there's, you, there's the comparison goes right out the window, right? In other words, God, some, God's going to give this many and this particular thing to this person. If you're trying to compete with this person over here with this many talents, you're never going to get there. You're going to spend your whole life miserable. So, you know, just that whole reiterating the parable of the talents, but also not to bury your talent. You know, we had one who, you know, gaming was more important than doing homework. You know, you are burying your talent. So anyway, not to go more into that, but just to say... The Bible really does have an answer for all of these things. And just to keep it in perspective, it's all going to come and it's all going to go. Uh, and friendships too. So focus on Christ and he will provide at that season of life. Okay. Uh, I want to make sure that I'm hitting on all of the social just really quick and performance. I'm just going to scan here. Perfectionism and worry comes up. And with, I know they... The, any of these people, can, I'm just going to say that the short answer, I think, honestly, is when it's, it's a need for control. We live in a world where we feel things are not in our control. Again, you got to put God in control. The, only way, the more you put God in control, the less worry and the less you're going to beat yourself up or your kid is going to beat, beat him or herself up over perfectionism. It's a control issue. When it's natural, Satan, Satan wanted to do it. Everybody wants to do it. Okay, some other questions. Now we're going to get into the parent part. We don't have too much time, but I'll, so we'll go a little bit shorter. But interesting questions. How, as a parent, do you deal with when your kids see things like same-sex couples or trans? Um, you know, how do parents deal with things that, you know, we don't want our kid we don't want to be too judgmental, but we also want to uh, show that that's not okay. In our family, we have, I'm, this is now me telling you as the real me, we have same-sex couples in our extended family. And when my kids were growing up, it was, it was hard to navigate that. And we just said, you know, we love, you know, cousin, you know, so-and-so, and they, they have not internalized what the Bible says. And they were saying that they were Christians, by the way. 
I went to, now, you know, you have Christian churches that accept everything. And, and so then they're saying, well, wait a minute, they're a Christian. They go to a Christian church. And I said, well, you know, we're always back to what does the Bible say, but we love that person. And I always remind my children, here's the bottom line. There's a reason God has these, these parameters in his word. And whenever we try to push and go beyond them, you're not going to see happy people. So what, how do you advise, you know, when you're, especially with the youngers, uh, you know, when they see same sex or trans or whatever, maybe a question comes up, how do y'all, how have you dealt with that? There's a rule um, called the rule of first mentions. And the rule goes something like this, that whoever mentions something first on a particular topic, that is the filter through which every other thing mentioned about that topic has to go through. So first exposure is, yeah, is the clinical term that is used there. I just liken it like a filter. Mom and dad are the ones that establish the filter. And so they're at school, mom and dad, and somebody says, hey, did you, did you hear in so-and-so, this girl has a girlfriend? The filter is mom and dad, because we've already talked to them about that. We've already talked to them about sex. We started talking to our children age appropriately, the age of six. Um, our son, oh, should I go into this? Yes. This is going to be recorded for all time. Grayson, I am so sorry if you listen to this <laughs> podcast. Okay. So, uh, 7-Eleven, we get out, we're walking in, we go in, buy our stuff, we come in back into the car, our whole family is there, our six-year-old son is sitting in the back seat, and he says, Mom and Dad, why does my pee-pee go up and down when I look at the magazine with the girls on the cover? She literally, she cowered over in the passenger seat like this. And I said, okay, here we go. We were engaged in the conversation, age appropriately, but he initiated it. And we took that as, okay, he needs to know. And so that's what we did. Meanwhile, you know, Bella's just, blah, blah, blah. she's three years old in the back seat. My point is this, when it comes to all of the issues that you're gonna see around, same-sex attraction, homosexuality, gender dysphoria, whatever it happens to be, as parents, you set the precedent. They might listen to their friends, they might hear their friends, they might watch the news, but ultimately, mom and dad have already said something about this. And there is no question, there is no doubt. So uh, the clinical term or the, the rule of first mention is kind of what, the way I look at it. And that's how we've dealt with it along the way. I have an uncle who's gay, he's been gay for 37 years, had the same partner. Um, that is something, we love him. Uh, by the way, and allowing something to happen doesn't mean you approve of it happening. Remember this. Simply because you allow Uncle Don to come into the household, uh, does, don't ever equate that with that I'm actually approving of it. But I love my uncle. I love his partner. We invite them into Christmas stuff. That is part of our existence. But our kids are really, really, under, they understand. And they're clear because of what we have said at home. Yeah, I think the biggest, the biggest thing is if you're not talking to your kids about these things, the world is. Right. So if, if you're silent, right, the world is not. Okay, and so and, and, and at what age? Okay, so Blue's Clues, okay, um, I don't know, Five Lies by Rosaria Butterfield. She just wrote it. She's amazing. Um, she came from that world, right, lesbian professor in Syracuse. Um, she was the one who, you know, pretty much propagated all these lies and sped, you know, spun them out into the community. She becomes a Christian, and now she's helping us understand, oh my goodness, this is the worldview that comes from. Um, but her book, Five Lies, she was just talking about, you know, Blue's Clues, had a drag queen, right? Um, so it's, you know, there's not an age that's too young, unfortunately now, to talk about gender and sexuality to kids because the world is talking to your kids at the youngest age. And, and it's, it's, we may have an age-appropriate conversation with our kids, the world doesn't. There's nothing not appropriate for them. So that's, that's the hard thing is like, well, I don't need to be talking about this to my kids because it's not appropriate. Well, the world is already so. Unfortunately, right, as a parent, we've got to dive in there and we've got to help them. Um, the reality is, is I mean, as you go through scripture and, and you know, as you said, the parent, the first exposure that you become in the filter, right? For, for us, it's like God's word is the filter. So that's what I go back to. It's not my opinion, right? This is what God has designed. And, and I'm just going to tell you, when does God talk about gender and sexuality? Genesis 1-1. 
right? <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for not waiting until the Gospels, right? Genesis 127, God created them male and female. So I'm just going to tell you, from the very beginning, this is part of God's design, right? Gender and sexuality, it's such a beautiful gift that the world takes, and because it wants to replace God, it has to replace all that God has created for good, right? So it has to replace gender and sexuality and marriage, right? The Bible starts with marriage, it ends with marriage. So I'm just going to tell you, everything that the world is throwing at us, right, God has given us opportunity to train our kids in. So from the very beginning, right, your kids need to appreciate the concept, right? You were created a boy. What does that mean? Well, guess what? There's boy parts. You were created a girl. What does that mean? Guess what? I mean, and you go through and it's just, it's beautiful. And as you read through scripture, can I tell you, there's a lot of places in scripture that are very sensual, that are very seductive, that are very, ooh, like, I can't believe God said that, right? Yes. That's how he created, right, sexuality. It's, it's an amazing gift. And I'm, I'm sorry that the world has corrupted it and made it nasty and that we feel like we can't talk about it because the world made it so awful. God made it so good, right? And we need to bring that back to our homes to allow our kids to celebrate something awesome that God gave us. We only have a few minutes, and I know uh, we wanted to talk about fear of failure and wellness. And so let me just, I'm a wellness coach. I've been doing it for 10 years. So let me just quickly say, Go through a circadian rhythm day. This is good for you and your children. You wake up, you get natural sunlight. The number one antidepressant is sunlight. It is the number one drug. So natural sunlight, okay? The less media, the better. Also recognize in your home when you have news or whatever or something else on, your kids can hear that. Even if they're young, they pick it up, okay? They are pick up your stress. So get your morning sunlight. You know, do your, your best thinking is early in the morning. The same with your kids. Their best learning, honestly, is earlier in the day. Out after school, that is the best time for them to have them move. Doesn't matter if they don't like extracurricular. They don't just get them. Our, our motto in our house is you're going to move. I don't care if it's through a sport or not. But they need to move, and so do you, to get your stress out. Get out there and move, and that time of the day is best for your muscles and strength and all that. Anyway. A zone two would be the morning, that would be light aerobic, and afternoon would be your heavier, like your, your sports, okay? Evening, the biggest thing is after dinner, shut those overhead lights off. We are constantly sending the signal to our brain not to produce melatonin. All these people are taking melatonin because we're, we're putting bright lights on ourselves at night. Our children, the blue light, yes, I know we have F-Lux and all these other filters, they don't work as well as you think they do. So my, I, our rule in our house is after like nine o'clock, we shut off all overhead light, it's all lamps. And I always encourage them to have at least one paper book in their bed. If they need to read before they go to bed with a lamp, let it be a paper book, best one's the Bible, okay? That's just the quick and dirty on it. But don't underestimate physical, act, physical activity is one of the number one stress reducers. So you get out there, too, and get your kid out there, however that's got to be. And I've driven, like everyone else, to a million, you know, um, club soccer and this and that. I would walk the field while they practiced. When I took them to swim practice, I swam in another lane. You know, do whatever you have to do, but you need to move, and they need to move. You need to get natural sunlight. You need to cut light and immediate night. It will make a difference in everyone's stress level. For fear of failure um, and any wellness tips you all want to add, but for fear of failure, I'm going to say one word. It's called learning. It's okay. You're just learning what worked and what didn't work. Okay, so you can't take the teacher out of the classroom. So I'm going to ask you a question as parents. I always want to um, engage the audience. Uh, with the show on probably one hand, how many times have you allowed your child to fail in the last week? So five times? So I'm just, it, give me, is it one time? Is it zero? How many times have you allowed them to fail? You know, as a school, oh, yes. I like that. I saw, <laughs> as a teacher and a school administrator, we know your secrets at home. Whether or not you have the mindset of trying to prevent your student from failing. I've watched parents bail their kids out. I used to stand at the front desk as a principal, and we were a one-to-one -one district where they had to have their iPads to do work. And I would see the parent running in the iPad. It was my fault. It was my fault. Here, I need you to get this to my baby in first grade. No, ma'am. 
It will sit right here and you may pick it up at the end of the day because we taught the kids in class that it was their responsibility. Take it home, we taught them how to plug it in. This is what you do. Load it in your backpack the night before. Put your backpack by the door, trying to prepare them. And good teachers will do that. But as a parent, that's your role as well. Allow them to fail. Oh, you forgot your lunch. I am so sorry. You are gonna be really hungry when you get home. And you know what, they're gonna live. Unless they have a physical problem where they have to have nutrition throughout the day, it's a good lesson, I can guarantee you. They will remember going forward. Do not bail your kids out, y'all. Allow them to fail early and many times. That's part of the learning process and I'm gonna tell you how important it is. I sat in a meeting over at lower school. We were discussing, our teachers are amazing and Jan Jeffcoat is a principal, she's doing incredible work. They're, they sit down um, on a monthly basis and talk about how do we support kids who may be struggling in specific areas. We talked about a first grader who was paralyzed with fear to participate in the classroom because she didn't want to be wrong. She didn't want to make a mistake. You're not doing your child any favors. Model it. Admit it when you make a mistake, when you mess up, when you could have done it a better way. You know what? My dad, I watched him. He was a woodworksman, carpenter, built so many things, measured twice, cut once. But he made mistakes, and we knew about it, and I learned from him. So you're the model. Show it. In fact, there are times, guys, where you're going to make a mistake, and it's going to be on your child. That's where you have the opportunity to make that apology. Be that model for restoration and going, you know what, son? I am so sorry. It was a tough day. You know what? I raised my voice. I yelled at you. I, I, that was a knee-jerk reaction. I should not have done that, and I apologize. I am so sorry. We had a practice in our house, when, and it really worked well with our youngest, where when it was a rough morning and he had already made three mistakes... He would walk, we did a, a it was called a do-over, and, and it was a physical change of space. He would go back in his room, he would sit for a minute, and then he would walk out and he'd go, okay, I'm ready, let's do this again, you know? And he would go, I'm sorry, Mom, you know? Okay, let's do it again. Good morning, Mom, how are you doing this morning? Can I help you get the things to the car? So those types of things, modeling that for kids is powerful. They're gonna make mistakes. What happens when they get pulled over by the police officer when they're driving home and they've been speeding? How do they react to that um, discipline that now comes in the form of somebody? And even for a teacher, how do they react to that discipline when it's not perfect? when they did make a mistake, when learning required trial and error 20 times sometimes, okay, let them fail. Sorry. No, that's great. I, I think the biggest thing, um, mistakes usually aren't 100% something, somebody's fault, 0% somebody else's. There's a lot of times mistakes are, um, you know, teacher forgot to post something, I forgot to do something. Wait, 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 here's the deal. Um, most problems that I see with my kids and with other kids is when we don't own our part, but we blame the other person. We're, like, we're super hard on everybody else for what they did, but we're very, very easy on ourselves. Um, and what I tell my kids is like, be hard on yourself, easy on others. So uh, the teacher didn't post it in time. Fantastic, okay, great, you know, mistake, okay? But what about you, right? Did you do the work that you were supposed to do? And I think that's the reality is, is why um, failing is so difficult is because we're just, Right, we're looking for somebody to blame all the time, um, and that is not a helpful thing, right? So um, the reality is, uh, I think um, a lot of our kids don't see failure in the home. Um, my kids have been blessed um, to see a lot of failure in our home, right? That's that's what I do well, right? I I fail I fail well, right? Um, and it's it's funny. I used to actually have a standard. This is before Shannon got here, so I used to have a standard apology letter that I would just send out, right? When I messed up. <laughs> Right? I just changed the date and sign it and send it to people. It's just like, my bad. I'm sorry. Um, but like, you, you, just, you need to learn how to apologize. You need to learn how to own your stuff. Don't blame everybody else for everything else. Like, let them figure. They failed? Right. Let them apologize. Let them figure it out. When you failed, you apologize and you move forward. Right? And, and I'm telling you, I mean, Maria's concept, there's a huge, a great book out there. And it is. It's that idea of um, you're either winning or you're learning. Right? There is no such thing as failure. Right? You're winning or you're learning. That's the only thing you can take away from things. So when you fail, you've learned, right? So that means you've succeeded in it. So move on. So basically,
basically, what is it, fail forward or fall forward? Just, just keep going. Just put another foot in front of the other, tell them. Thank you, parents, so much for your time. I know these people could, the, the wisdom here and the amount of time that we have, but I just really, it's really to kind of give you a connection point so you can see, I mean, Michael's work with life recovery at the church is a full-time job, passion, ministry, dedication of his life. So just know that him and his wife, who also is a life ministry associate, these people are available at the church and um, have many programs and many different ways to pour into people. So it doesn't stop here. This is really more of an introduction so you can get a feel uh, for these people. And also, um, Dan is constantly putting out, since I've known him 10 years ago, he's always at the forefront of educating parents and you know exposing us to things we may not know about yet or may not be ready to talk about yet or learn about yet. And he's always, and his podcast is amazing. If you have a chance, listen to his podcast. And we are so blessed to have Dr. Cole as our head of school. Her, she is the most even balanced, even keeled, wise, brilliant. And I can, you know what, I, I'm at the end of my career, so I'm not looking for any, I'm, I'm serious. We are blessed. So please know that her countenance and her putting the Lord first and her joy and her um, always wanting to just strive to do better for our families, put our families, put our students first. It's, it inspires everyone. Teachers are happier. The school's happier. I believe students are happier. So we are so blessed to have her as head of school. So just wanted you guys to meet these people and know, oh, I remember Dan said something. You know what? I'd like some more information on that experience of what he went through. Go to Dan. Go to our life recovery people, you know, Dr. Cole. So just know that. And me as well, I'm a biblical counselor. My door is always open. I, I schedule with parents. I schedule with students so always happy to give that time because it blesses us so thank you for your time i hope you were blessed today and i hope you were encouraged as you go forth and that god picked you because you are the perfect parent for your children in jesus name